Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And I know, I know, this past week must have been brutal because we did you dirty with that all to be continued, but don't worry, it's all coming to a head today, we promise. If you're new here and just starting to listen, hey, hi, hello, now stop listening for a second and go back to last week's episode first. You don't get to eat your dessert before your dinner. There, now that that's cleared up, it's time to figure out what's happening with Kenny. Where will this ride take us? Buckle up, because you're about to find out. Getting back to where we left off, Kenny Pont was just sent to the clink and booked for murder. Wonderful. We're getting somewhere. But we're not there yet. Kenny was only arrested for one murder, the murder of Rochelle. I know what you're thinking. He was linked to all those other girls that turned up dead under similar circumstances, but he's not going down for them? What do the cops have to link him to Rochelle, but not the others? We'll soon find out why he's arrested, but first, a quick recap. Last week, we learned that Ken had a relationship, professional or otherwise, with several of the dead women. At one point or another, Ken had legally represented both Mary Santos and Nancy Paiva, dated Robin Rhodes, and had Don Mendez hammering on his front door seemingly looking for him. Though, the one relationship that stood out more than the rest was that of one with Rochelle Dobierla. Ken had been seen driving her around town on more than one occasion, and they were rumored to have been living together. Another odd connection is that Rochelle and Nancy used to be roommates, too. Small world. Digging into Ken's past, we find out that he came from a decent family, but he was certainly no Eagle Scout. For some reason, he seemed to rub people the wrong way. In his late teens to early 20s, Ken would become a frequent flyer with police. He developed a heroin addiction, which led him to at least one drug-related conviction prior to becoming a lawyer. As he grew up and matured, he pulled his shit together long enough to attend law school and pass the bar. While practicing law, it didn't seem like he was interested in developing a strong skill set, but more so with just doing the bare minimum to pay the bills and feed his drug habit. Yep, Ken had managed to kick the heroin, but now with a newfound stream of income, found cocaine to be his drug of choice. It seems like quite the coincidence that Kenny would go on to represent many clients from Weld Square. Perhaps in return for assisting with their cases, they'd help him find and buy drugs? In early 1989, a woman came forward with some information that seemed to tie Ken even closer to the missing women. She explained that she knew firsthand that Kenny had spent an awful lot of time with local working girls and went on to give a rundown of one night they'd spent together. So there they were, hanging out, doing cocaine, when she says Ken insisted on watching a porno with her. This was apparently a common occurrence when Pont was with a working girl. He loved snuff films. The woman goes on to describe the video, stating that it depicted a woman being raped and killed. With this information, police went on to gather every snuff film from the New Bedford area. It's believed that the police did this in order to try and link acts committed in the films with the possible M.O. of the killer. So I actually didn't even know what a snuff film was before we started researching on this case. I thought that it was porn or whatever, but I didn't know that it actually had a murder committed in it, which makes it even weirder. I mean, I I get it now because, like, to snuff something out, to, like, put it out, to kill it, whatever. But it's awfully strange that this guy would not only, you know, hire a working girl, but then bring her somewhere, watch a porno with her where, you know, somebody's getting killed in it. And, you know, think about how that progresses in your head. If he's into watching that, there's a pretty easy connection that he made you know, progress to doing that himself. I thought it was funny when, like, we were talking about this and we're, you know, researching, we're talking about the case, and I'm like, oh, my God, and he was into snuff films. And you're like, oh, he, I mean, whatever. He's a scumbag dude. He likes porn. I'm like, yeah, but he likes porn where people die. Like, that is significant to, like, who Ken is as a person, I guess. He just... I don't know, he's a weirdo. (laughs) Like That's just really weird to me. I think it's weird because it's uncomfortable to think about, but to him, that was like something that he he got off on. But imagine being that cop that gets stuck in the room 
with all the the pornos. Someone just walks in and they're like, oh, what are you doing? It's like, oh, it's work. It's work. I'm busy. I'm working here. (laughs) (laughs) This is around the time where Ken's name starts being dragged through the mud. The media was all over him. His career was tanking and word was spreading like wildfire about his possible involvement in more killings. He was being talked about on every street corner and not in a good way. The women he so frequently kept company with were now fearing him. And this frustrated Kenny. How would he get his fix without them? It's obvious that Ken has a lot piling up against him. He was connected to many of the women that were found dead. He was said to be the last person to see Rochelle alive. And now we learn that he gets off on watching these snuff films? I mean, come on. But it doesn't stop there. We then find out that Ken had left New Bedford in 88. Supposedly, only a short time after police believed the killings to have ended. So did they end because he'd left? Now, if this guy doesn't fit the bill, I don't know who would. This brings us back to the ending of our last episode. In August of 1990, over a year after the last body was discovered, Ken was arrested and charged with Rochelle's murder. The district attorney at the time, Ronald Pina, was very particular in his words when describing the charges against Pont. He made it clear Ken was only being charged with one murder, and he was not being linked to any others at this time. When questioned about his involvement in Rochelle's murder, Ken was always steadfast in his denial, not only regarding Rochelle's death, but also in the deaths of any of the other women. During Pont's arraignment in Bristol County Superior Court, he entered a plea of, and I quote, absolutely not guilty, your honor. While awaiting court proceedings, Ken is interviewed several times. He's quoted stating that he welcomes a trial and that he wants to get this witch hunt over with so he can move on with his life. I guess he's trying to clear his name? Hmm. That doesn't seem like the best strategy for such an unlikable guy. I mean, we know how the media works. No stone is usually left unturned or rumor publicized. Bob Ward, a reporter for Boston 25, had gotten to know Ken fairly well during the media frenzy. He stated that he'd learned quickly that Kenneth Pont was not someone to mess with. Bob claimed he had found out the hard way that Ken had a, quote, very explosive temper, explaining that during an interview, when Bob went off script and asked Kenny about the highway murders, he screamed at him, going from normal talk to completely over the top in a matter of seconds. Bob goes on to say that he'd even witnessed firsthand Ken's ability to become violent at the drop of a hat. It later comes out, after Ken's indicted, that he's said to have beaten Rochelle to death and dumped her body in a gravel pit off Reed Road, just a short distance south of I-195. What's interesting about this piece of info is that Rochelle's body, while close enough for a potential link, was the only body not located directly along the highway and was substantially more concealed than all the others. This may be one piece of evidence distancing her death from that of our serial killer, but not necessarily from Kenny. It's certainly possible that Pont is still guilty of her murder, and he had the unfortunate luck to have disposed of her body in the general area where this major investigation was taking place. I mean, prosecutors still said he had motive, and that he killed Rochelle to prevent her from providing any undisclosed testimony against him. This testimony was most likely linked to an event that occurred in April of 88, when Kenny pulled a gun on some guy that Rochelle had accused of raping her. It was rumored that Kenny liked to act the tough guy, that he would escalate even the smallest conflict, let alone a claim like this from a potential friend of his. Well, Kenny's temper would come back to bite him. Rochelle would later recant her statement regarding the rape, but the charges against him for the assault stuck. Some believe that Rochelle was going to be called as a witness in this case, and if her words helped convict Kenny, it would look bad for him, to say the least. But by the time any of this would pan out, Rochelle was already missing. Going back to when Ken said that he is absolutely not guilty, Your Honor, and that he welcomes a trial, saying less is better. So when you get in front of the judge, you say, not guilty. And then when people are like, oh, you know, we want to go to a trial, what do you think about a trial? To say that he welcomes a trial and stuff like that. Like, you want to try and distance yourself from the media at all costs. You don't want to be going out doing all these interviews because, sure, you might be thinking that you're doing a service for yourself because you know that you're not guilty and you want to go out there and you want to prove it to people. But if you say the smallest thing that somebody can twist and morph into their agenda and make it look a certain way, it's only going to be bad for you. So I always think that saying less is better when you're in that type of position. And then when we move on to, you know, these depictions of Kenny, it it definitely leads to the idea that, you know, if 
he already has this temper and then Rochelle was going to, you know, throw him under the bus. I think the more that we get into this, the more likely it is that he's involved at least in Rochelle's disappearance and subsequent murder. Yeah. And to go back to what you said before about he should say less to the media, he so like when everything started, he supposedly was quiet. And then, you know, I think the media was just like hounding him, hounding him, hounding him. And I think finally he snapped and he's like, well, I welcome the trial then. You know, if you want to talk crap about me in the media, like that's kind of how I I picture it from him. That would go, you know, hand in hand with his temper. And Mm -hmm. like Bob Ward had said, being able to, you know, go from zero to 100 real quick and, and just becoming, you know, irate at the drop of the hat. Yeah, he's a he's a real fired up guy. Seems that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, remember when I told you about contradicting information? Well, here's a doozy. Like I had mentioned before, Kenny left New Bedford in 88, but based on several different sources, it's not definitively stated if that was in September, October, or even November. An article from the Associated Press stated that Ken had moved to Port Ritchie, Florida, and he was arrested down there on June 12th for allegedly assaulting a woman. June. June! Our serial killer was most likely still active in June. If that's accurate, then a monkey wrench was lodged directly into the timeline. The article goes on to state that Ken was later released on personal recognizance due to lack of evidence. As we look at all of this information, and as the case against Pont continues to move forward, it becomes clear that while most of this evidence appears to be fairly damning, it's almost entirely circumstantial. There is no physical evidence connecting Rochelle's murder to Kenneth Pond. Again, the bodies were all so badly decomposed that it was practically impossible to collect any significant DNA evidence. Not to mention that we're talking about the 80s here, where it wasn't really commonplace to go the distance with this type of work. The media doesn't seem to care about any of these facts, and they continue to run with the idea that Ken is the serial killer police are looking for. I'd say now is about the time where the case against Ken begins to fall apart. Now, I'm not going to sit here and make a case to acquit Kenny of any wrongdoing, but hear me out. We already know that two of the women were killed by strangulation, and both of those women were found along the highway. Put that up against a beating death where the victim was then concealed in an abandoned gravel pit two miles from the highway? That doesn't seem like the same MO to me. And yet you continue running with the story that Ken is the guy, having no concrete evidence. Yeah, I think the media is losing credibility with me at this point, at least. You want to go after Ken for what he's being charged with, the murder of Rochelle. Stop undermining the investigation by going all these other routes and saying, oh, all these other women were killed too, and trying to link him to that. I mean, the prosecutor didn't mince words. He said, Ken is being charged with this murder, not with any of the other ones. So when the media just keeps running with stuff like that, it makes me question everything that they put out. The FBI is always saying like, Don't put out a press conference. Don't put out wrong information. Don't, you know, tell everybody this. And then, you know, if if someone goes out into the media and says one wrong thing, it could totally screw up the entire investigation and a serial killer can stop or move or, you know, leave the area, whatever. And I'm like, they're just they're just doing everything you're not supposed to do. You're doing everything that Criminal Minds tells you not to do. I get that. But you also are running on fumes here with information and you want people to know about it that way like you say if you see something say something if they don't put it out to anybody then they may never get the information they need in order to close the case yeah that's true i just base my life on criminal minds so (laughs) (laughs) to make it clear i think kenneth pont is a bad guy and yes there is an abundance of evidence that points towards him but i don't believe he is the new bedford highway serial killer He is, though, in my mind, the most likely suspect in Rochelle's murder. He's a big Eddie that likes to push his weight around, likes to treat people he thinks to be beneath him like crap. Multiple sex workers would come forward confirming these descriptions. They'd say how he would become aggressive, but never physically hurt them. Sure, until he did. He's a sex-addicted drug addict that loves to watch snuff films. What do you think the natural evolution of his character would be? But as time goes on, the case against Kenny gets thinner and thinner, and by the end of July 1991, all charges against Kenneth Pont are dropped. Ken moves back to Florida for a fresh start, and it seems to be going well for a while, until authorities pull him back into the investigation one more time. They excavate the land surrounding an old property where he used to live, a 
apparently to search for potential remains of other women he may have killed or any clues towards his involvement in the highway killings. Nothing would ever pan out, and Ken would die a few years later, taking any secrets he may have been hiding with him. With Pont's charges being dropped, police continue working down their list of names. The next person to become the target of their investigation was Anthony, aka Tony, DeGrazia. Tony is a 27-year-old punk who had a reputation for cruel treatment towards sex workers, having been said to have choked and raped them in the past. Based on testimonies from working girls who spoke with police, Tony used to act like a really nice guy, and then once you felt safe, he would turn into a crazed lunatic, forcing himself on you and assaulting you. As more people hear that Tony may be involved, they come forward with stories detailing his propensity for violence. Tony was quoted as having told one girl, I'm going to kill you, you bitch. Another girl even ended up testifying against him in front of a grand jury. Tony found out and guess what he did? He freaking tracked her down, attacked her and told her, I'll do you like I did those other bitches. What the fuck? How did he get away with this stuff? Mm Mm-hmm. And dozens of other women would come forward with similar stories. That's crazy. Then, in April of 1989, Tony actually has the gall to admit to the attacks, but publicly denied killing anyone. Oh yeah, hi, uh, my name's Tony. I like to choke and rape women, threaten their lives, but nah, I absolutely did not kill anyone. Like, come on. Who says that? (laughs) Does he really think that's believable? All right, all right. My rant's over. Come on. That's our MO. Choking, assaulting, threatening death, and, you know, finally escalating to killing someone via strangulation. I think we might have something to go on here. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, police turn up the heat and start investigating Tony for the highway murders, but their work would be cut short. As Tony's unrelated court hearing on charges for rape, assault, and battery, and assault with intent to rape rapidly approached... He looked for a way out. On July 27, 1991, Anthony DeGrazia committed suicide. I know what you're thinking, and so did Paul Buckley, a special prosecutor on the case. Mr. Buckley is quoted saying, If an individual was suspected of committing a crime, and that individual takes his own life, then people could surmise he could have responsibility. My thoughts exactly. Though Tony's attorney, Robert George, stated that his former client was not the killer. I'm definitely with you and Mr. Buckley when, you know, someone's about to go down or somebody's really getting the the spotlight put on them for something and then they go and they kill themselves. I think it's pretty easy to link that they may have some type of involvement with it. Well, I think you can go one of two ways. You can be the Kenny Pont of the world and be like, I welcome a trial. Absolutely not guilty, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. I want all this media coverage. Or you can go the route of Tony DeGrazia and be like, nah, mm -mm, nope, we're all set here. (laughs) I'm not going through this. So... Rumors of his potential guilt continue to circulate even after Tony's death. Mr. George openly stated that he believed what happened to Tony was a miscarriage of justice. He states, quote, The handling of the investigation and the case killed Mr. DeGrazia. Maybe that's the investigation we should be looking at. He goes on to add, It's easy to blame the dead because they can't fight back, end quote. We get it, Mr. George. You have an obligation to your client, alive or dead, but come on. Tony took his own life because he knew that he was implicated in this case due to his pattern of abuse, regardless if he was a killer or not. It was his own guilt that brought him to that decision, not the people uncovering his misdeeds. We may never know the truth regarding Tony's involvement, but two officers that had been working on the case went as far as stating that they'd stake their pension on it, being him. There may have been even more substantial evidence linking Tony to the killings, but due to his death, they were unable to be followed up on. As I continued researching, another miscreant emerged. Before I reveal the name, we need to cover some backstory. It may seem inconsequential at first, but the pieces will start to fall into place. Trust me. Puzzle piece one. On October 23rd, 1996, Teresa Stone would be seen by her daughter for the last time. Based on court documents, we believe the following to be true. That evening, she left the house to buy groceries and at some point stopped at a bar for a few drinks and left alone. When she got back home, she told her daughter that a man in a black pickup truck had given her a ride, and he was waiting outside for her. At some point, she expressed that she did not want to go with him, but was reported to have left anyway, sometime between 9.30 and 10.30 p.m. Teresa would never return home. Her body was later found on October 25, 1996, along a roadside in Fitchburg, Mass., presumably killed by strangulation based on further examination. 
It was stated that she was most likely killed a short time after intercourse due to the fact that no fluids from the suspect had been transferred back onto her clothing as they would have had she gotten dressed afterwards. DNA evidence was collected, but a match was unable to be made at this time, and the case would soon go cold. Puzzle piece two. We fast forward to 2008. A woman came forward alleging a friend had sodomized her and then attempted to smother her to death at the Reservoir Motel in West Boylston, Massachusetts. Police were in luck this time. They had a victim that was able to bring them back to the crime scene and identify the perpetrator. The man is soon arrested and charged. His name is Alex Sesney. If Alex Sesney was a friend to this person, I would hate to see who this girl has for enemies. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's just the verbiage because I know that working girls sometimes say, oh, it's my friend, it's my boyfriend, something like that. So maybe that was something that was just lost in translation in you know, public record. Mm. But when I hear that a friend had sodomized and attempted to smother her, I'm like, a friend? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, there was some other stuff online as I was looking into that and none of it was like fully substantiated like court documents stated friend but there was a potential that they had dated and then broke up and then you know she didn't want to say like ex-boyfriend or something so Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was like that kind of relationship between them but yeah it's just a weird way to describe someone like Mm -hmm. he's not your he's not your friend and who knows maybe she didn't describe it as such but like I said maybe it was Mm. lost in translation when it actually went went out to for, through the uh, through the public relations officer or whatever. Mm. This is where we reach the turning point in Teresa Stone's cold case. Once in custody, Sesney's DNA was collected and entered into police databases. Sesney's DNA profile is a match to that which was collected back in 1996. Alex suddenly had a lot more to worry about than he realized. Now this is another piece to the puzzle. Keep it in your noggin, because we've got to move on to the next. Prior to the events of Alex Sesney's arrest, Worcester police are working a case in the main south area of the city. It's a tale we've heard too many times by now. Another hunter targeting sex workers, having killed at least five so far. We learn that these murders all took place in the early 2000s. The bodies of the five women, Betzeda Montalvo, Carmen Rudy, Danelia Torres, Lindeda Oliveira, and Wendy Morello, would be found between 2003 and 2007 three of which were discovered in the main south area of Worcester, one in Hudson, Mass., and the last was found stuffed in a trash can in York, Maine. Another piece, we're getting there. As police work through potential leads, they name their suspect the Maine South Woodsman Killer. During this time, they release information that the remains of Montalvo and Rudy were both discovered on the property of the Hillside School. Coincidentally, Alex's father William was said to have ran the farm on the same property, and lived at 217 Robin Hill Street, which was located on the school grounds. Alex had once listed this address as his residence. Police later stated that Torres was found in Hudson, Mass., just two miles away from Marlboro, where the school was located. These three bodies would all be officially tied to the main South Woodsman. Oliveira would be found in a wooded area in Rutland, Mass., approximately 40 minutes from the others. And lastly, Morello was a female found in Maine. Neither of these two casualties were ever formally linked to the woodsmen, but were believed to be associated due to similarities in the investigations. Here we go, the home stretch. In 2007, authorities investigating the Maine South Woodsman case began working with Stock Inc., a profiling team whose mission is to aid law enforcement in the apprehension of serial killers. Stock worked on a profile of the killer, which was later released. The profile stated that the suspect worked as either a truck driver, maintenance man, or construction worker, and was between the age of 28 to 41 at the time of the murders. They went on to state that he most likely drove a pickup truck or SUV and may take part in fishing or hunting as a pastime. He wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He's addicted to sex and pornography and loves having control over these women, essentially playing God, choosing life or death. I know that this profile is for the Maine South Woodsman killer, but you could pretty much copy and paste it into the investigation for the New Bedford Highway murders, and it seems like it would be a perfect fit. Yeah, I agree. The thing that sticks out to me is where it says that the killer loves having control over these women. It brings me back to what James Fox said that we talked about in the last episode. I mean, that right there is that copy and paste, like you said. Yeah, it's crazy to think that, you know, even though all these things happen years apart, that there are so many ways that you could potentially link, you know, this guy that we didn't even hear about before until all this other stuff came out years later to the the murders 
that happened, you know, in 88, 89 area. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And I mean, we talked about in the last one, like, oh, maybe the number 11 is, you know, it means Mm -hmm. something. And then maybe they felt as though that's it. I'm going to stop. But then, you know, years go by and it's like, I can't stop. And you can't hold back the urge for for forever. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that kind of goes into it, too. Unfortunately, all five of these murders would end up going cold. That is, until 2008, when Sesney was arrested for the rape of his, uh, friend? As his DNA is connected to the death of Teresa Stone, Alex is charged with her murder. With this information, authorities now look to connect him with the main South Woodsman killings. While probing further into Sesney's background, it's clear that he has a record of violence towards women, having been charged in multiple rape cases dating back to as early as 1996, the same year Teresa was killed. As bad as this guy is, he's also one lucky son of a bitch. He's charged with beating a sex worker, raping and attempting to strangle another woman, and the rape of a minor. All charges dropped, or the case lacked too much evidence and was later dropped. You gotta think about how infuriating or discouraging this is to the victims, that this guy who's clearly a piece of shit is potentially going to get away with doing all these things to you, unfortunately because of lack of evidence or, you know, maybe they felt scared and that's why they dropped the charges. I'm frustrated. I'm not even involved. Mm -hmm. Now, I know what you're thinking. Sure, we get it. Alex Sesney is a terrible human being, but what does he have to do with the New Bedford Highway killings? Well, that's what I'm getting to. Sesney's arrest history isn't the only thing potentially linking him to our victims but also his driving record. In 1988, around the same time our victims were going missing, Alex, about 18 years old at the time, gets pulled over and written a speeding ticket in Freetown, Massachusetts, where multiple of our victims were found. Circumstantial be damned, this seems like our freaking guy. At least to me. Parties working the case had even mentioned how our victims were never left in New Bedford, always just outside Don't you think that this would imply that the person involved is traveling through the area and maybe not exactly from there? Even with all this information pointing towards Alex as a possible or maybe even probable suspect in our case, investigators involved aren't yet convinced. Some say based on Sesney's age during the time of the killings or the fact that his name never came up back in the 80s and 90s while working any potential leads. I don't agree with that at all because... 18 years old is clearly old enough to do anything. I mean, people much younger have committed serious crimes. And when we talk about, you know, the profile of the killer or whatever, or when we were thinking about how all of these girls had been killed and found later on and nobody was really linked to it, it makes you think that, you know, they're relatively meticulous or they're carefully crafting what it is they're going to be doing. And that goes to connect to the thing that you said about, you know, traveling through the area. Yeah, you know, maybe somebody was way down below New Bedford and they were heading up north or whatever. And they, what better way to get away with something is to pick up a working girl. Nobody has ever seen you in the area before. You take her wherever on the side of the highway, do your thing, kill her, dump her body, and then boom, keep going on the highway to your destination. It's like you were never there except for the person that you picked up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it goes into why I at least think Kenny Pont is responsible for Rochelle's murder. That would be completely out of the way for someone who's traveling through, who's just quickly doing what they're doing right off the side of the highway. Where Rochelle's body was found, it was just so far into the woods. So, I mean, someone could likely see your car or stop at the same place or you just, you don't know, that's too risky. Right, and you said before that Weld Square is a fishing town and the profile for the main South Woodsman killer said that he was probably into hunting or fishing. So we could say Alex was, you know, aware of Weld Square because he had stopped off there for some type of fishing thing before. So he kind of knew that there were a lot of working girls in that area. So he was like, oh, well, the next time I'm there, you know, nobody really knows me there, but I'm going to stop off. I'm going to pick somebody up. Boom. I'm going to take the highway, do my thing, drop the body, then keep going to my destination. It's like... So if you were able to connect the the profile for the main South killings to Alex and then Alex to the New Bedford Highway killings based on that profile, I mean, it fits the bill. You have Alex Sesney from the area, generally. 
is an adult at the time or very close to being an adult, gets a ticket traveling the same highway area where all these women were found, and then he progressively over time continues on his path of violence towards sex workers and women, gets arrested for a murder later on, he's accused of raping and sodomizing a friend, like all of these things are piling up against him that... I know how you said circumstantial evidence, but if we can link that profile to Sesney and then Sesney could totally, I think, be linked to the New Bedford Highway killings based on, you know, lumping everything together and trying to attach him to everything. Yeah. And that profile came out in 2007. So that came out before they even knew who Alex Sesney was. So for them to have come out with such a a, in my mind, spot on profile that really matches Alex Sesney. Like we find out that he's a construction worker Mm -hmm. right in there. He drives a pickup truck or an SUV. He might go fishing. He might like all, it's like every single point. It's If, if you can link the profile to him, then you can link him to everything else. As our story stands in 2021, Alex Sesney is serving a life sentence for the murder of Teresa Stone but has not been charged in connection with the New Bedford Highway or Maine South Woodsman killings. But as the old saying goes, it ain't over till it's over. Investigators are just looking for that one little shred of information to come in and blow this whole case wide open. I think that with advancements in technology and like DNA in particular, there's always that chance for somebody to find the break in the case. Yeah, there were a lot of detectives on the case that were talking about the DNA evidence and how back in, you know, the 90s and the early 2000s when it was first coming out, they needed like a much larger sample to be able to match anything. And as the years have gone on, the sample can be smaller and smaller and smaller. And they do have DNA evidence. They did actually send some off to a lab in 2008. But I mean, it's it's 2021. If if there had been any breaks, I'm sure we would have heard by now. Mm -hmm. But for all we know, DNA technology is going to continue to get better and you, you know, will have smaller and smaller samples that you can use. So there is the potential that in the coming years, it could break wide open because of that. And the crazy thing too, is like the amount of evidence they have, it's literally four wooden pallets wide and six feet tall of just boxes and boxes of evidence. That's crazy. And I mean, like they're not messing around. Like I mentioned in the last episode, like, we couldn't discount police because they have cared about this case since the very beginning. And that is true. They have this evidence under strict security. Like, you need to have a certain clearance to even be able to get in. Reporters, they were like, nope, sorry, we'll take a picture of what's in here and then show you outside of it. Like, Mm -hmm. they want no potential for tampering. Yeah, well, think of how bad that would be. They do this entire huge investigation. They're working on it for 30 plus years. And then because some dumbass makes a mistake then it all gets, you know, thrown out for whatever reason. Yeah, which would just, God, that'd be heartbreaking for everybody involved. It would be, yeah. I believe there's still hope, and that one day, authorities will be able to provide closure to the victims' families involved. If you have any information, no matter how big or small it may be, please contact the Massachusetts State Police Unresolved Case Unit at 508-820-2121. We want to know what you think. Do we already know the identity of our killer, or are they still at large, waiting to strike again? In closing, I can't stop thinking about all the bad people we've talked about in this case, and the fact that there are still so many out there that can be involved. It reminds me of a quote from my dear friend, Spencer Reed. Actually, it's more like we're looking for a needle in a pile of needles. A needle would stand out in a haystack. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.